I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Eva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 57 people are murdered every single day. These are the stories of the killers and the people who hunt them. I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me. My name is Paul Vivian Llewellyn. I'm a journalist and I'm curious about Africa's killers, criminals and the cops who catch them. And joining me to discuss crime on the continent as always is Jared Lubbaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS Threat Management who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases and he is the profiler. Please visit our YouTube page and do subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button. It's the important part. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. Um, encourage your friends to subscribe. We really want to grow that aspect of the podcast and get more subscribers onto the YouTube page. Um, we're available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Simply search Profiler. Again, please share the link that you like to use with your friends at the office in the gym or as we like to say in your murder cult you can engage with us on our social media pages our twitter and instagram handle is at profiler africa um, we do post uh, you know photographs and additional information newspaper articles um, from the various crimes that we discuss um, as we go so it's always nice to have an eye on the uh, social media pages when you're listening to the episode um, please do join our group on facebook any questions, suggestions, um, we want to take more and more of these. We really want to get your insight and input and your suggestions for topics that we could cover um, in the course of the episode. Also, if you want to get involved, if you feel like there's some way that you could help out with the podcast, please, um, you know, let us know. And we're happy to open up a conversation and a dialogue with you. You can email us at profilerafricainfo at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out and get in touch. Okay, Gerard. The year is 2004. Contextualize for us. Where is Jared Labaskachny in 2004? And how does the case of Tommy Williams initially come onto your radar? So obviously by that point, uh, April 2004, um, I had been in SAPS for just over three and a half years. Um, so I'm kind of, I suppose you could say, coming into my own as understanding what I'm supposed to be doing profiling, etc. And I recall correctly that myself and Elmery Meinberg from the unit were driving back probably from Cape Town. And we happened to stop over in Kimberley as we would often do, and there's often lots of cases for us to consult on. And we were informed by then Detective Inspector Fernando Luis, who is from the Serious and Violent Crime Unit, they've just got a new case in. A young boy whose body's been found in Warrington, which is one of the sort of smaller towns on the I think it's N12, if I recall correctly. And they've got a possible suspect. Can we interview him? So we said, sure, we're always up to interview a murder suspect, uh, specifically when they've mur allegedly murdered a child. And we get called in to sort of interview a guy by the name of Tommy Williams. So essentially, the background to the case is during April 2004, this little 13 year old boy, Tabang Bihi, was discovered partially decomposed um, in the back of a house that had been repossessed um, by the bank. And what the banks typically would do to protect their investment is they would employ someone to stay in the house just to kind of look after it. And um, this body had been disco uh, discovered in the back of a house that Tommy Williams had been looking after, but he'd suddenly asked the bank if he can go and look after a different house. He didn't want to stay at that house anymore. And the body discovered partially buried in the back garden, which was kind of overgrown, etc. Discovered how? Um, I think someone else who came to stay in the house went to the backyard and found a partially buried body. Um, okay. And we'll show some pictures, obviously tactfully chosen, uh, of what the person was confronted with. And you could kind of basically see the skull sticking out. And no, I mean, problem. the skull is, it's not sticking out, it's lying on the ground. So there's a, in the backyard, you moved into your new house, and there's a skull lying on the ground. Of course, you're going to call somebody up, aren't you? Yeah. So, um, and then kind of they figured out who, who had been staying there. Tommy Williams was the name that popped up. The boy had gone missing on the 14th of April. And the body was partially wrapped in a duvet cover, of which the other half of the duvet cover was in the house being used as sort of makeshift curtain. 
Okay. So that's okay. how we kind of get, that's what the police get called out to. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the start. And, and then a completely decomposed body. When yeah. This is not a crime that has happened in the last month or two. Yeah. So Tommy then gets sort of found in possession of some items belonging to this deceased young boy, some tools, some electronic equipment, some jewelry, etc., cetera, um, that belonged from this, this boy's house. So the house where the body was found was not where this young boy lived. He stayed sort of further down the road, but as was known to sort of be friendly with Tommy Williams. Okay. So a lot of things were sort of pointed, obviously, as Tommy as a good suspect to bring in and start to question. Okay. And that's kind of what what happened. And okay. initially, so that's, and that's where you get brought into this case, and then you meet Tommy. Yeah. So initially, he even denied that he was Tommy Williams when he was brought in for questioning okay. um, by the Serious and Violent Crime Unit. Um, he then kind of started to admit, okay, he is Tommy Williams. And yes, he did have some items from the, the, the deceased victim's house, which, like I said, was a different house to where the body was found. And he said while he was guarding that house, as the banks had employed him to do, an unknown man came into the house, was strangling the, this deceased, and instructed Tommy he must help hold down the deceased, the victim's legs. Okay. So, like, again, a really stupid story. Totally unplausible, unbelievable that some random dude is strangling this kid and instructs you who happen to kind of enter this house, hey, you must help out, which he then alleges he then did. Okay. Um, he then tried to also bring allegations that there was Sangoma and Muti. Uh, those were all excluded, um, etc. Now, you think that he will be charged. Unfortunately, the prosecutor didn't want to actually charge. Okay, but now l let's talk about this. You've now gone and interviewed this guy. You immediately get a, do you immediately get a sense that, that he's pulling the wool over our eyes, that he's lying? Um, how does it... How does it get to, I mean, surely you're giving your insights to the yeah. prosecution team saying, this guy, this guy's a problem. Yeah. We shouldn't be letting this guy back onto the streets immediately. So definitely, I mean, I mean, in technical terms, we knew he was speaking bullshit. Yeah. Um, Fernando, the investigator, who was an incredibly experienced uh, murder investigator, Fernando Luis, at that particular point in time, knew that this is nonsense. Um, he's found a possession of items belonging to a deceased person. He has a nonsense story about he was somehow roped in against mm. his will to some random stranger who asked him to, who instructed him to help kill someone by holding down his legs. And we were thinking, okay, great, you know, this is definitely a prosecution Turn and proceeding. And Easy. the advocate of the high court who was assigned the docket said, no, there's How? not enough. How does that happen? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I know the prosecutor very well, and she's an incredibly competent prosecutor. But what made her decide that there's not enough evidence to proceed against Tommy? I, I don't know. Uh, and, and and Fernando was livid with that decision. I think for years he didn't talk to that prosecutor, which is very difficult difficult in Kimberley, when you know you are from the Serious and Violent Crime Unit, and most of your cases go to the DPP's office for high court prosecution. But um, he was very upset about that, and I, and I and I appreciate Fernando's passion for for. Let's talk a little bit about that. How, as a, a psychologist or a cop or as, as a detective, how do you deal with? taking home that information. So now you know that there's a person out there, it's your job to catch these kinds of mm. individuals and you know that there's somebody out there that has committed a murder and is very potentially out there doing the same thing right now as we speak. How do you take that home and to kind of make peace with it? Look, I can honestly say that in, in the cases I dealt with, I this is probably the one, I'm gonna just be, be a bit of leeway, say maybe two cases where we were 100% certain someone did something and there was a de decline to prosecute. Um, you know, we've had it more often, not more often, but one or two more times where the person was prosecuted and there was a not guilty verdict and we kind of walked away flabbergasted. So I can definitely say from experience that's soul destroying sure. when you know this guy did it because of, you know, in, in the case I'm thinking of, the guy confessed to me that he did it, but that's not admissible in court. Um, and he finally gets found not guilty. Um, it's it's really just it's uh, i mean if i'm just thinking as, as an example of that particular case and this particular young man was 15 16 and he killed a little a young girl i it was it's destroying and but you you have to get on and move on you've got other cases 
Um, I remember I got that day in Durban when, when this particular case I'm referring to took place and there was not guilty verdict, oh, ridiculously drunk before I got on the plane. I don't know what the poor passengers next to me thought of this guy was literally crying and obviously very drunk. Mm. And I remember writing a, a letter to my boss, highly emotional about my trip to Durban. And he kind of just said, you know what, you got to just, you got to move on because mm. this happens, unfortunately, whether it's pre-prosecution and as in the Tommy Williams case or a case that just doesn't go your way in court and you have to be functional for the rest of the cases that you have to help out with yeah and that's almost again that clinical distancing from cases as far as you can which comes into that whole issue of gallows humor and how we sort of separate ourselves from the work we do mm -hmm. because you have to carry on for the other cases that are out there that are that you're currently dealing with and that are going to come your way tomorrow the day after. what kind of psychological support is available for the psychologists and the detectives who work on these cases look in general saps does have psychological services, which was something that was separate to our unit. Mm -hmm. uh, our unit was purely aimed at investigations. Whether those are effective, whether people want to go to those and make use of them, or rather make use on POLMED, which is a police medical aid, which is actually very good medical aid, or just deal with it by speaking to friends or family. And, and typically, I think what happens in most cases, and definitely in my unit, is that we would be our support for each other. You know, as I said, the people I worked with, Elmery, Yanni, um, Joyce, Butelez, who joined us later, and, and Andrew Quinaiti and, and Aubrey Sechwaleo, who kind of the stalwarts in the unit, as I still say, were the people that became your friends and that you would discuss these things and your frustrations with, um, sometimes with alcohol flowing, sometimes mm -hmm. not. And I think that supportive group of people that you we really cared about each other and enjoyed working with each other, that became your safety net. They mm -hmm. could understand what you were going through. Yeah. And just knowing that there's people who could relate to your frustrations was very, very helpful. But we never went off for psychological counseling debriefing. Should we have? I think one can argue that one we should have. Well, I, I, can, I can concur. Okay. Just having known you now a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I really realized that after I left and the time that it took to decompress from these cases and get distance from them, um, that yes, and I think it's getting more difficult because it's more frustrating now in the police than when I was there. Mm. Things aren't functioning as they should. Yeah. The quality of services for us as policemen relying on forensic services and all the other sort of services out there isn't quite what it was. Mm. A couple of years ago, so I, th I think it's even more frustrating for people left back in the police who really want to do a good job and work hard. And you, you can do it. You can never do that in isolation. You have to rely on your forensic services, your crime scene guys, mm. good prosecutors. And oh, mm. I don't see us overall getting better yeah. in those areas. I, just, I see it getting worse. Yeah. And I can only imagine for my colleagues the frustrations that they have to face. Yeah. Well, look. I mean, the reality is, is that at every level of government, there's kind of like there's been a decline um that's that's just the reality of it isn't it hopefully post this last year um we'll come into a new age where people are kind of a little bit more motivated to 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 do things the right way hopefully maybe yeah it's saps with saps so it did yeah anyway um sorry i wanted to ask you guys then get so Another thing I'm curious about is, you know, it's a Saturday afternoon. I mean, I think about my kind of media colleagues. We'd get together, have a bry on Saturday afternoon and, you know, bitch about the boss and talk about work and what have you. Were you guys able, I mean, this became, this is your work group became mm. to degree your social group. Are you guys able to disconnect from, from, yeah. from this reality in that social environment around the Brian a Saturday afternoon? Or do you find yourself talking about cases with these guys when you congregate? Yeah, look, we didn't require a Saturday afternoon uh, for these things to oh, happen. Okay, in the police, cool. we would Monday Bry morning. <laughs> at any occasion, any day. And if we were up there visiting and we stopped over in Kimberley, like we would have done in this case, I can guarantee you that you know, the policeman that you knew, you would be somewhere by four o'clock. Uh, I could even say now that I'm out the police before four o'clock. Chopping a dope. Having a braai, drinking a lot of red wine or whatever your poison okay. was. Uh, and that's, again, I, you know, the alcohol side was not so great, of course. Mm. Um, but it was that opportunity to commiserate with your colleagues, to get worked up, to support each other, to talk about cases, sometimes to solve cases by mm. drunk policemen talking to each other and okay. realizing that this case sounds like a case they had before, <laughs> yeah. whether that used to take place in the old police canteens, which they were clo which they closed down, okay. um, or just around the Bri. And, and the, the people in the Northern Cape are incredibly social people who look mm. after their guests. Yeah. So yes, that kind of stuff definitely did happen. And it served a purpose um, 
in a way, the policeman who didn't want to go see a psychologist, maybe so. And in 2004, you have a good reason to be supportive of one another around your frustrations mm -hmm. because the prosecution has decided that Tommy Williams will not be prosecuted for a murder, which it, or everything's pointing at that that he yeah. did in a in a property that he yeah. he lived at. So um, take us from there. Then let's yeah. get back to Tommy. Where what happened after this after this 2004 incident? So at that stage, I mean, it was a single murder. Uh, tragically, yes, of a young boy. But you know, we have lots of murders. We had cases coming in all the time, and we move on. You know, that was it. We did our interview. We buggered off. We later heard he wasn't going to get prosecuted. You know, what can you do about it? Yeah. You know, Fernando would have done the best investigation possible so there wouldn't be a shortcoming. Uh, you move on. And we don't think about Tommy Williams or this murder probably at all, um, to, be, to be honest with you, because we've got hundreds of other cases we're dealing with. Yeah. You kind of fast forward to 2008, February, um, where we have another body popping up in the Kimberley area, uh, as opposed to Warrington, where the first murder was that we just spoke about from 2004. And... Again, Tommy Williams' name surfaces in relation to this particular murder. He was the last person seen alive with this victim. And of course, Fernando Luis, the original 2004 investigator, hears about this and he's like, nah, <laughs> he knows. No, this person's name is coming up in association with too many bodies. Fernando had been trained in serial murder investigation in the old days, I think, of Mickey Pistorius. And as I said, in his own right, a phenomenal investigator. And he knows that, ah, we um, need to relook at Tommy Williams. We're going to definitely relate to this case. Here. And um, we, it was later through the investigation uncovered that he'd made anonymous phone calls to the deceased's family, stating that the deceased had left the area of Rudapan because he was afraid of going for a scheduled operation. Now, this particular deceased did have spinal problems and had an operation scheduled. And basically, we say, look, you know, um, Norman has left the environment, and that's the name of the victim. Um, he's scared for his operation, so he's buggered off, essentially. So Tommy Williams pops back up on the radar. We need to take a look at this 2008 case, and we will do that after a short break. Please subscribe to our page on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. We're available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Simply search Profiler, and you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa and join our Facebook group. Also, if you want to get in touch with us on email, you can do so. ProfilerAfricaInfo at gmail.com is the email address. Lots to talk about in the next segment. Don't forget Gerald's brand new book is coming out very, very soon. And uh, we'll be back in a flash. We are back. You are listening to Profiler Africa on whichever platform you prefer. Um, I'm here with Gerard Labaskakni, as always, the Profiler. We are talking about a uh, series of crimes that happened in the Northern Cape. Um, a man by the name of Tommy Williams. After the 2004 disappointment, he comes back onto the police radar in 2008. And that's where we took a break. Gerard, take it from there. Mm. So now we're looking at February 2008. The case was registered at uh, Rudapan, which is sort of surrounding Kimberley. And a young man by the name of Norman Vartelmeyer is found dead. Tommy was the last person seen with him when, when Norman was alive. So that automatically brings you definitely at least as someone you'd like to question, if not as a potential suspect. But of course, now we have Tommy Williams' name being associated with another murder. Mm -hmm. And Fernando Luis is on top of this immediately. He knows he's still sort of chomping at the bit about the 2004 case. He knows that this is, you know, unlikely. He was trained in serial murder investigations, highly experienced investigator. And it was through the investigation, they start to realize that Tommy made anonymous phone calls to the, to the victim's family saying, um, Norman has left the area because he's afraid to go for an operation that he had scheduled. And he had back problems. Um, and basically, um, after the body was found, also made an anonymous phone call implicating someone by the name of Tefu. As the, as the suspect in the murder. Okay. So again, they trace that back to Tommy Williams. Okay, so another another tall tale from Tommy. Um, forensically, looking at that 2004 case, the body itself, was there anything notable um, with regards to the kind of the, the way that the person was killed? Um, so uh, were there any not kind of notable links forensically between the 2004 case and now what they're seeing in 2008? 
So the 2004 case obviously was very decomposed, but yeah. they they found uh, a parochially a shoe shoestring shoelace in the kind of around the neck area. So it was believed that strangulation played a role in the death of that particular case. Okay. But also, if you recall what Tommy said in 2004, um, he had to help hold down the legs while this yes. other guy was strangling him. Ah, okay. So we have saying strangulation as a part of the process, yes. if not the cause of death. And that became a linkage factor, um, partial linkage factor across some of these cases. Okay. So. In the 2008 case, we've got the, the anonymous phone calls that are traced back to Tommy Williams. He was found to have given or sold items belonging to the, dead, the deceased victim in 2008, his safety boots and his cell phone. Um, and also when the body is found on, on the 12th of February, guess who goes with the family to identify the body at the mortuary? Tommy Williams. Okay. So in a way, again, what we see with serial murderers is sometimes inserting themselves mm. into this process in some way, whether it's the, the excitement yeah. Or whether it's to find out if there's any potential leads. Like we that discussed might. with Stuart Vulcan going Absolutely. to the crime scene is to see if he can take some tips on improving for the next time. No, no. What happens though when the family start to realize that Tommy also, from their point of view, is is too close to this, they take him off to the felt, and essentially he confesses in front of them, um, and that is recorded on a cell phone by the family, and was ultimately also admitted in court as regarded as a confession to the to the member of the public. Okay. Yeah. So that was a. What are some of the implications around what can? What are some of the issues around what can and can't be used mm. with that kind of evidence in court? Well, look, any evidence of a, of a confession. Um, so again, ironically, if if I as a suspect get arrested by a cop, let's say I arrest Tommy, mm. and he turns around and says, "Gerard, you know what? I going to admit I killed." Um, Norman Watermeyer now and old um, Tabang Bihi back in 2004. I, I just, I was angry and I strangled and killed both of them. Him telling that to me, even if I've read him his rights, is not admissible in court. Because it's Why? made to a policeman. It's not done with the proper formal warnings. And whenever you do take a formal confession, there's a whole bunch of warnings you have to give the person. You know, you, you don't have to do this. Were you threatened? Were you warned, etc. So him confessing to me as the investigating officer is not admissible in South African law. And that's basically developed from a mistrust of the police. That a policeman would lie and say, oh, this guy told me that he did it. So it has to be written down with certain warnings taking place. And typically not to the investigating officer, but to an, a, 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 an officer. And I mean that a captain or otherwise, a, a commissioned officer who had no involvement in the case. To avoid this person just writing what okay. he knows happened or to a magistrate but this was recorded by a family member correct so a confession to a member of the public is regarded as admissible in other words it can get into the courtroom okay. the next thing that the courts would do though was say was the, pub the public are inherently more trustworthy there than the go. police <laughs> of course the next that but that just allows them to get into the courtroom this recording they would then have to determine was this coerced was it free and voluntary? Or did someone have a gun to his head and say, say this or else? And that's sort of the next step is to determine the admissibility in terms of was it free and voluntary? Was it coercion, et cetera? Uh, and, and that's in any confession, something that has to be determined. Um, okay. And then typically what you find, even with your confessions that are formally done properly to a police member, officer, or a pointing out, typically the suspect who changes his mind would say, but I was threatened, I was forced, I was coerced. So the, that, that aspect is going to be determined whether or not it's to the member of the public mm. or done formally and properly to the necessary policeman or magistrate. The admissibility okay. thereof would be, would, would be questioned. Do we have that same thing in South Africa that if you, are, if you are arrested by the police and brought into an interview environment and then you say that um, you want to have an attorney um, is that where you kind of mm. have to stop interviewing then and let the... Yeah. So we have... Similar? Similar to what you see in American t TV, the Miranda rights. Yeah. In South Africa, it's the right to remain silent, the right to legal representation. If you can't afford legal representation, the state will provide it for you. Um, not to say anything, etc. What you say can and will be used against you in a court of law, which, quite frankly, no, because, again, there are certain things that were prohibited mm. but you give those similar very similar kind of warnings in terms of the constitutional um i think it's article 735 of the constitution your rights as an arrested person that you have to say but again it still doesn't mean that if you do say something to me it is going to automatically be admissible in court um, but even sometimes a person saying i was nowhere near kimberly on that day in question but then you find out through cell phone information or eyewitnesses that he was that becomes something you can use 
because it's not a confession. Now, on a case by case basis, this may seem like a frustration, but really, the re it's a good thing that these things exist because it really speaks to the fact that our constitution does really take your rights as an individual very seriously. Yeah, like, like we, I always say to people, oh, this is all frustrating. We should allow the police more leeway to do things and to be more aggressive and to be shoot, you know, shoot to kill kind of make it clearly kind of comments. You know, that's fine and well as long as you're thinking about very bad people. But what about the day you are the suspect? Unfairly so. Or the police pull you over at a roadblock. Yeah. Then you're going to think very differently. And yes, it might sometimes be seen as frustrating and hampering when we're doing murder investigations. But like I said, sadly, I don't think our trust and faith in the police is getting better. And then we really want to make sure we have our rights enshrined in the Constitution Absolutely. and protecting us because... What happens tomorrow if the police pull you over, try to get a bribe out of you, you say no, then they say, well, I'm arresting you for uh, attempting to assault me. Yeah. Um, and then we do want to make sure we have exactly. admissibility of evidence, you know, for and foremost and our rights as citizens. So, and again, if you're doing a good police investigation, you don't have to take shortcuts. Yeah. Nowadays with forensic evidence, we can get a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, it is still possible to get people to do proper formal confessions in the right way. So it, it boils down to just doing things properly. You can still get your successes as a member of the police. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Let's get back yeah. to the case then. So to, we're in 2008. Yeah. So, so his cause of death was strangulation. So we have Tabang Bihi, the 2004 boy who had the, 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 the shoelace around his neck. Mm -hmm. Cause of death in this particular case uh, of Norman Vartman in 2008 is strangulation. And Tommy Williams, as I said, has seen as that items that he had, he had was he sold to people or gave them to people. Uh, went to go identify the body. And as I said, those four phone calls were traced back to him. And he's then arrested for murder and theft. Okay. So. So. What happens then? What happens? So what happens then? So as Fernando was busy with his investigation, and of course he's hauling out that old 2004 case, mm -hmm. wanting to add it to his list of charges, someone says to him, but you know what? I recall back in 1987, I mean, how long before these other two murders, mm -hmm. that um, Tommy Williams found a body of a little girl, eight-year-old Marta Boerter, who was his neighbor, who had been sent to buy some bread. And she was last seen walking with Tommy Williams, who was then, back in 1987, 16 years old, who lived next door to her. And a couple of days later, um, he finds, and I say that with a little inverted air, Air, inverted commas, um, a body near a nearby stadium where he went to go have a pee. And Fernando was like, you have to be kidding me. There's no way he just found the body. Mm -hmm. And he his little serial murder antenna are going off the charts. You're going, yeah. I've got to find this docket because you cannot tell me this guy's name is always just coincidentally surfacing in relation to people who end up dying. And, and now we're looking at a across a span of 21 years. 21 years. And that would make Tommy Williams the longest operational serial murderer we've ever had. So there's a reason for the name Tommy Williams, which you may not be familiar with, to suddenly be on your radar as a true crime fan in South Africa. This is yeah. the longest, uh, longest serving active serial killer in South African history. And this is where I often, you know, people talk about serial murder. When I get contacted by journalists who want to do documentaries, they talk about the Moses Satoles, mm. the Wemma Pan serial murderer, the Norwood, which are fascinating cases. But I want to say to them, but there are so many other cases since then that really we are now dealing with on Profiler in, in yes. this series. That yes, there are Netflix. That, that haven't really been spoken about mm. at all, who mm. are just as fascinating or fascinating for different reasons, that you don't have to go back to all those old cases, which have been done and dusted so many times. Yeah. Um, there's so much new stuff that's happened that is really fascinating and, and really reflect brilliant police work mm. um, and dedicated people. Look here, it speaks immediately to how important this kind of retained intelligence is within the police services. You know, if you've got a high turnover of staff, there is absolutely no way that you've got somebody remembering Tommy Williams being involved in a 1987 case. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it just goes to show how important it is to have consistency and to, to retain intelligence within the police services. Yeah. And when you speak about the fact that, for example, your intelligence has not necessarily been retained within SAP as effectively as it could, 
it is cause for kind of disappointment and concern. It's that really. institutional knowledge that's yeah. absolutely essential. That you can employ a hundred people tomorrow in a unit. If you don't have institutional knowledge, that mm. means absolutely nothing. Absolutely. What well, I mean, what does this imply then about all of those years in between? What was he up to? And again, and we've said this before in other episodes. You know, it was only in we know we only had DNA really forensically in South Africa in a crude form in the mid mid nineties. So what was he doing between eighty seven and nineties? And even after we started to get forensic DNA used, and it was only in about two thousand and eight or nine or ten that we started to process all the DNA that was sent into a laboratory. So typically in South Africa, what happened was if a victim was raped or we had a, a murder where there's possibly a rape and DNA samples were taken, they were not submitted to the forensic laboratory in some provinces. Or if they were, all they did is they opened up that exhibit and tested it to see if there is DNA sample on that, on that, on that swab or sample or whatever evidence it was sent in. They didn't process it further and load it onto the database. Okay. What they would do is they would wait, they would send a letter back to the detective saying, hey, we opened up this little sample you sent us and we did find DNA. So when you arrest someone, take that person's sample, send it in with this reference number for the case, and we will process the suspect sample and that initial crime scene sample to its full extent to compare whether the two match. So they were only using DNA as a as a means to link a particular person, mm. potential suspect, to a crime scene, not so they, as they like, weren't testing it against the entire database. Exactly. And there were there were certain issues from a legal point of view about having a, a DNA database. Um, yes, I agree with you, but they were only thinking of this is something we're going to use for evidence in court. They weren't using it as what we call an intelligence database. When it mm. let's send all the stuff in and have it swimming around, and when we get a new case and we drop it in there and it matches an old case, boom, we'll get a link. Or we get a new suspect and we drop it in there, boom, it's going to match five cases. That only happened at 2000, and as I said, about, about 2010, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So Tommy Williams could have been raping and killing in the interim, yeah. but because he might not have been identified as or arrested as a potential suspect or even approached for his DNA as a potential suspect, those kits would be sitting at the either at the police station or at the lab, but not added onto any database. So he could have been doing other stuff without a doubt. I would be surprised if he wasn't. So there's very potentially murder cases from that area that are sitting, there's forensics sitting in a storeroom somewhere that could possibly link Tommy Williams to other, other murders. Yeah, absolutely. Or other crimes. That's It's amazing. It's interesting. Uh, where does it take us? Where do we, uh, on another tangent, where does this kind of, what does this speak to our cold case mm. capabilities in South Africa? You know, again, looking <clears throat> kind of from American media, you, it's a big part of the kind of law enforcement effort there is that it seems that counties will have a cold case team of retired detectives that come back and yep. work on those old cases. And it's great fodder for tons and tons of television programs. Um, do we have a cold case capability locally? Or do we have an active cold case active cold case teams around the country or no no Short okay. answer. we don't <laughs> okay. and sadly i would say the overwhelming majority of our murders become cold cases sure so you would have how big would that team have to be yeah so we we don't have adequate policing in terms of our current murders because we still allocate one docket to a detective we are not solving 58 murders every day definitely not so where do you divide it? You do channel the energy into solving current cases and just say, well, we're going to cut our losses with the old cases. How do you divide your resources to, uh, I, it's a decision I wouldn't want to be the one to have to make. Mm. But like I said, we, we, we still overwhelm our poor detectives dealing with murders with too many cases. Like I always say, in the UK, you have a single murder, you have a unit of 20 people whose sole job it is is going to be working on this. And whatever resources you want on top of that, mm. human or otherwise, will be given to you. Here we have one detective with 20 to 30 unnatural death cases that they are investigating. And my colleagues overseas, like they can't believe that, who will be sharing his vehicle with two or three other detectives. Mm. Um, you know, it's, we, set, we set them up for failure in that regard. Yeah. It, it, look, I, it, yeah, it's something which, uh, I mean, it's certainly interesting from our perspective mm -hmm. as the kind of folks interested in kind of looking back at crime, because it makes you feel, it makes you think that there are crimes out there that we could be, absolutely we could be looking at as it's interesting how citizen kind of detectives have played a big role. If you look in America again, specifically cases like the Golden State Killer, that seems to be a case that was ultimately solved because of 
kind of citizen detectives mm. getting involved well, and, you know, and, 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 and reworking all of that, that information. There's an interesting documentary that I watched last year on Netflix called Don't F with Cats, mm. which I thought, oh, I, I don't really like cats, so I'm not going to watch that until I actually went and saw what it's about. Go watch that because that's a prime example of what you just said. Um, of how citizens pick up something, realize that this is a red flag for something worse, go on their own to start trying to identify the person. Starts off with a guy who posts a video of him strangling or killing a cat. Mm. And that sets these animal lovers livid. And they go and they start to trace who it is. And it turns out that that guy is a Canadian serial murderer. Mm. And they pretty much identify him even before the Canadians realize there is a problem. And this guy was ended up chopping up body parts and sending them to the parliament, if I recall correctly, yeah. and posting videos of, of killing people, yeah. etc. And that's a prime example of what you've just said. And fascinating. It's not about the cats, people. It's about a serial murderer. Yeah. Definitely go watch it. It just speaks to the kind of depth of interest there is around crime in this country. There's, there's so many when when I when we're thinking about what direction we can take the podcast and there's so many places you could take it kind of digging into yeah. old cases. Yeah. This would certainly be very interesting to look at what was happening yeah. in that period between 1987 and trying to identify if there's forensics sitting in sitting in a storeroom yeah. like we say somewhere. Absolutely. Um, Okay, so let's get back. <laughs> yeah, sorry, back to the 1987 okay, massive, murder. yeah, we took a massive so, detour there. This little girl lived next door to Tommy. Um, Tommy was last seen walking with her when she was on her way to buy some bread uh, by witnesses who were later actually traced. And then a few days later, he finds uh, this body near a stadium, disused stadium where he went to go have to urinate. Um, autopsy says the cause of death was strangulation. So, and, and there was evidence of genital penetration. So again, we have okay. three cases where strangulation at least played a role, if mm. not was the cause of death. Back then he was treated as a witness and not charged. Although then you can see, if you look at that investigation diary, that, investi that investigator knew mm. that, that this was something wasn't adding up, but there was not enough evidence to charge Tommy. And back then, think about it. But this guy finds the body, now you charge him. Nowadays, we would go, no, that's one of definitely the first guys we're going to be suspicious of from a serial murder point of view. But again, this would have been a first murder. He's a 16-year-old kid. People back then were probably looking at this going, that's impossible. You know, why would a 16-year-old? He just mm -hmm. found the poor girl and now, et cetera, et cetera. So how we view things was quite different now from back then. Okay, so in the final segment of the show, we will talk about how all of this information was put together and how ultimately Tommy was brought to justice. Um, you can subscribe to our page on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. We're available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Simply search Profiler and you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa. You can email us profilerafricainfo at gmail.com. Any questions or suggestions and do join our Facebook group now and you know share the podcast with your friends ultimately that's what we're aiming to do is to um yeah help to drum up more interest in the true crime genre in south africa and see where that takes us so we'll be back after a short break Welcome back to Profiler Africa. Please do uh, share the podcast with your friends. Um, we're always looking for more listeners and uh, hoping more people will enjoy the podcast along with us. Uh, Gerard, we are talking about who we've now identified to be the longest running active serial killer in the country. Somebody you may not have heard of, a man by the name of Tommy Williams. Let's then talk about how after years of i mean we don't really call it blundering but we call it just not connecting the dots as mm. they should have been connected maybe to be nice about it um how did we, all of this information come mm. together now and tommy ends up being locked up for these crimes mm. so essentially fernando at the time of the 2008 murder of norman which we thought was the second murder he realizes okay we got a serial here mm. he hears about this old 1987 murder which he, which we discussed already yeah but of course 
he yet doesn't know who that victim was. He just hears about this from someone. Yeah. Nobody walked up to him with a docket and said, here you go, Fernando, have a look at this. Sure. So now Fernando has to figure out, how do I find this docket? How do I, uh, yeah, someone's told me about it, but that's very different to having evidence. Mm. So he then starts to scroll through newspaper records, the old, you know, what do you call those things? Those, um, oh, well, the library, yeah, I know. Yeah, you, you know, you see them in TV with yeah, that yeah, black yeah. and white, uh, microfish, I think is the what micro, they call it. Microfilm, yeah. yeah. And he kind of finds, he gets a name of the little girl. Uh, Marta Butta, I think it was, as I said. And then he kind of starts to find, right, now I've got a name. Now he goes to the court because it would have gone to an inquest if nobody had been arrested and charged. But the inquest docket, I think, is was missing in the courts. Then he kind of goes to the Khalashiwe police station and he says to this docket store clerk, I'm looking for a docket that is like 21 years old. Now, I've been in police archives. Some of them at the stations are an absolute disaster. Some of them are fairly well maintained and orderly by year and by case number, etc. This was in the 87, we were using a different case numbering system compared to what we use now. Um, but, and, and I think literally, I think Fernando said at that station, somebody had lost the key for the Docker store. So people would literally through the little vent, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, little window above the door. People would literally throw, <laughs> throw in the old case files. But he had traced the docket clerk who said, you know what, I'll look for this for you. So I'm just thinking like, if you told me this back, I said, Fernando, just forget it. You're not going to find this docket. Mm. And that docket clerk comes back to him, probably must have been covered in dust and what a hero. What and finds the actual old file. Whoa, so yeah, again, yeah. I think as I said, the gods or God wanted this docket to be found. Absolutely. And as I said, he then uh and we end up do charging him for all three of these particular so okay. So like I said, it's in retrospect it became a serial murder investigation yeah. as opposed to an active one, you know, we've got one body, now we suddenly got a second one. Yeah. And and purely to do the determination. So we ultimately got a trial with an, um, the three murders that I've, we've spoken about, uh, a kidnapping charge, which would have been included in those theft charges because he had items belonging to the victims, um, an attempted rape with a little girl uh, because the genital injuries indicated the possibly rape, but also with two cases of assault from where he had tried to uh, strangle two of his girlfriends. Now, this is, again, stuff that are coming out through Fernando's inquiries, he speaks to ex-girlfriends. Two of them have said, yes, he should try to strangle me. We add those charges. And again, interesting strangulation, which is what we saw as present in part of the murders. So it lands on the table of, of a very accomplished prosecutor, Tienz Barnard, who I had worked on many cases with, single murder cases, the, the Naba Beep Springbok serial murder case, which you might discuss, also quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and Tienz was just a very, very good prosecutor. And I've said before in many instances, and I mentioned in the book, you think the Northern Cape was a sleepy little place. You do not want to be uh, targeted by one of the high court prosecutors. They are very good and very accomplished. So it was him and advocate Mashucha, who were both the prosecution team. Um, the defense, he had legal aid, Tommy Williams, uh, Dries von Tonder, who again, who had been the defense counsel in numerous of the cases I'd also dealt with, and a, and a very good, honest, uh, le and competent legal aid prosecutor. And that's always nice. You know, people often think, you know, you want the guy to represent himself or you want bad legal representatives for you. No, it just makes life phenomenally more complicated if you don't have a competent legal counsel for the defense. Mm -hmm. And Dries was very, very experienced and competent. He, Tommy was not an easy guy to work with. He refused to, to consult with his lawyer many a times, uh, which led to the delays in the start of the trial. I'm sure Dries, Advocate Fontana, was wanting to pull his hair out. But ultimately, he pleaded not guilty to everything except uh, for one count of theft in relation to the 2004 case where he was found in possession of some items belonging to that little boy who was murdered. Um, but he, since he refused to admit all the elements of theft, the court rejected his guilty plea on that theft count, and we went to trial with a not not, guilt, uh, not guilty on all of the um, counts. That was his plea. Okay. He was found fit to stand trial, because again, that's always a question, you know, are these people mentally ill or not? He was sent for observation, and he's, he's found fit. But, you know, the, the, the antics didn't stop there. So right in the early phases of the trial, he's suddenly in the courtroom, is seen ingesting some white powder and falling on the floor and having like a fit of some sort. <sighs> of course, now he gets admitted to the hospital under very, very close guard. Mm. And, um, and he's released shortly thereafter in a healthy state. Um, so now we eventually start the trial. And what kind of evidence do we have? So basically we had circumstantial evidence. You know, he's lost one scene with a little girl. He's lost one scene with Norman Vartemeyer, the recent one. He stayed up the road from the 2004 case. 
um, the items that he was found in his possession, and of course, similar fact evidence, which you've spoken a lot about in this series, about what is similar across these cases mm. that could, the court could use to say similar act facts, similar acts, therefore we link it to this guy. So in that 87 case, they, I mean, again, this is the, the miracle of the 1987 case, they actually found the district surgeon who conducted the autopsy. I mean, miracle on its own. Sure. They actually found the investigating officer. Um, as well as important witnesses who saw him walking with the little girl, etc. And it basically centered around him being the last person seen with her, walking with her in the direction of where her body was ultimately found by him a couple of days later. So that's kind of the evidence. Remember, we don't mm -hmm. have DNA linking him to the 87 mm -hmm. case uh, or, or her, her possessions in his, in his, in being found in, in his Was there position. any sexual activity on that first Well, it body? was believed from the autopsy that there was penetration of or, or tampering okay. with the genitals, let me call it that. So in terms of the 2004 case, we had his admissions that he had helped some random stranger um, strangle yes. the, 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 the boy. The duvet in the grave was, was found. The other half of the duvet was in the house yeah. that had been used as a curtain. He had items belonging to the deceased and the deceased father after his death. In the 2008 case, we had the cell phone evidence where he made these anonymous phone calls to the victim's family. We had the confessed re confession recorded by the victim's family that he made, um, that he'd given items belonging to the deceased to different people and the cell phone, the boots, and the admission to his own girlfriend that he and this fictitious Tefu guy had killed Vartemeyer. All right, so again, nothing like DNA, um, et cetera, or an eyewitness. When you spoke to him, any admissions of anything? Well, I mean, I hadn't spoken to him in terms of the 2004 case yes. back then. I didn't re-interview him after his more okay. recent arrest. In so, 2004, though, when you spoke to him, any? Just the stuff that he said that he, he helped this random oh, stranger. He was instructed by the yeah, random yeah, stranger yeah. to help him. What to, just, just for something we haven't touched on, is just what were your impressions of him as a, as a person? Um, not particularly impressed. I mean, a, a wimpy kind of guy. He's a small, scrawny guy, as, as we often hear me say in these cases. Mm. Nothing oppressive, nothing aggressive, kind of pathetic in, in nature, and and almost like as I said, like not much to really remember. Yeah, uh, spinning a story, but happy to answer your questions, yet spinning a story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, what evidence did I kind of contribute? Well, I did a case comparison across three cases. I commented on the modus operandi and the circumstances, and I my aim wasn't per se to link the cases, but I just rather was trying to say you have an eight year old victim, you have I think a thirteen year old victim, you have a twenty eight year old victim that yet there are still similarities that might not be at first as observant to the court. And I said, what were those similarities? Well, firstly, he was older than the first two victims. He was older than the eight-year-old girl. I think he was 16. He was older than Tabangbi. He was 13 back in 2004. Uh, Norman would have been sure, you know, already in his 30s. Uh, I mean, Tabang, sorry. And the final victim of the 2008, the adult guy, was a sickly person with spinal injuries. So he always had some physical dominance or superiority over those victims. I said that in, in all, all three cases, there was post-mortem tampering. You know, Marta, the little girl, had been covered with grass and, grass and plastic. Tabang, from 2004, had been partially buried and covered with branches. Norman, he'd actually, what we hadn't mentioned so far, he'd actually set fire to the body. So there's post-mortem tampering, which is not a common thing. Um, in terms, we had strangulation featuring in all three of these cases in, to some degree. Either confirmed strangulation was the cause of death with the little girl and the last victim, and to bung them, the intermediate victim, there was a shoelace around his neck. Um, the court obviously was looking broader and could comment on, 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 on more similarities. Um, and I can actually read what the court said in their final judgment. Um, it says here, to the above three similarities, one can, which is my similar similarities I just mentioned, we can add the following. Firstly, strangulation, which is a somewhat unusual method of assault, and yet we have five strangled victims. He's taking into account the two girlfriends um, who were also strangled. Um, in two of the three instances, items had been removed from the scene. In other words, the 2004 and 2008 cases that belonged to the deceased and were found in his possession. That in all three incidences, the victims were well known to the deceased. So in my linkage analysis, I never comment on the suspects, so I couldn't really refer to those aspects, but the court's picking up on it. They knew all three of these victims. Um, and in 87 and 2008, he was somewhat involved in all these investigations to some degree. Um, and he, in 2004 and 2008, he always tried to deflect the blame on someone else. So 2004, he tried to say it was some random stranger who was responsible. 2008, he tried to say it was this guy, Tefu, who was responsible. Um, 
And the court took all these similarities into account and said, you know, this is enough for us to say that this guy is responsible for all three of these murders and the the subsequent assaults. Um, The state's case was closed. The defense did not call the suspect to testify, which is very common. Uh, You don't have to. The law doesn't say anything about it. And you cannot uh, make any adverse inferences by not him not testifying. Um, They didn't need any other evidence, let alone him. And as I said, that's quite common. And ultimately, he was found guilty um, in, in terms of the 87 case. They at- acquitted him on the attempted rape, which is fine. And you often seem to get the impression that the court will let one little thing go, <laughs> perhaps to say to show that they were being fair. Uh, we, okay, we not enough evidence for the, not, for, the, for the attempted rape, but we do find you guilty on the murder due to similar fact evidence. In the 2004 case, they acquitted him on the kidnapping but they found him guilty of the theft of the items belonging to Tabang Bihi and found him guilty on the murder for circum- with circumstantial evidence. And the 2008 murder of Norman, the adult guy, again found him guilty of the murder based on circumstantial evidence and guilty of the theft. And for the two young ladies which he strangled, they found him guilty of assault GBH. So again, people often say circumstantial evidence um, is not weighty enough. It's enough to get you convicted of murder, that's for sure. Uh, it's not lesser evidence. Um, and what was really nice, and I think does mean a lot to us in the police, because um, we often don't get much of a congratulations from anybody, was what the court said right at the end. And I'm going to quote again from the judgment. And the judge said, the state, and, and here I include the two prosecutors and the SAPS investigation team, have excelled in investigating and prosecuting this case to its ultimate successful conclusion. The difficulty should be self-evident given the fact that the 87 murder occurred 22 years ago, the inquest docket could have be, had been destroyed and material witnesses had passed away or retired. Um, the same obstacles presented themselves to a lesser degree in the 2004 murder. Dogged persistence and diligence uh, invest, dil- diligent investigation coupled with meticulous prosecution have borne fruit for the state. The investigation and prosecution teams are deserving of commendation and we un- and we unreservedly oblige. You know, it is a great example of good police work ultimately because it speaks to that kind of consistency and at the end of the day being able to put all the pieces together. Yeah. But it's also a case which is an example of 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 letting things go, which shouldn't have been let yeah. go, isn't it? It's and I think, you know, the, the one person here who, here who really does, if, if, if you had to take one role player out, they would have had the most of a negative impact if they hadn't done their job. Fernando Luis, mm. the investigating officer. If he hadn't dodged it, he could have said, look, I'm not going to find that 87 docket. Yeah. Uh, it's impossible that we'll never find. He could have left it there and nobody would have said anything that was, you know, would have criticized exactly. that. Um, or if he'd said, um, you know, I'm just not bothered. It's not my case. Who cares about the 87? I've got two pretty good cases here. Mm. Um, so if you took Fernando's motivation, dedication out of it, we wouldn't have had what we saw today because a prosecutor yeah. can't do anything without a, without a detective who's gathered the evidence. Yeah. So really, Fernando Luis gets what, what deserves was, the credit. What was the sentence? Um, that is a good question, and I am not sure if I actually have that information. Um, was he well, was he locked up then for life? I would imagine so, because, because you have ultimately that just the reason I'm asking is because that really as well speaks to how important this kind of continuity in the fact that you had an investigator so passionate at the center of it who was ultimately able to link these various cases together had he just been charged and prosecuted for the one murder case then it's you know he could be out of jail in 10 years time um but you put more on the plate and you lay more at kind of his doorstep and that means that you're getting a a a, a bigger prosecution and you're you're able to lock this man away for a longer period of time. Absolutely. I mean, if you take a, just a single murder, you you run the risk that he, if they, for example, think it is not premeditated, that he could have gone to jail for 10 to 15 yeah. years, quite quite exactly. believably. Yeah. Um, I see here, sorry, I've done quick work with my Google as you were talking. Um, <laughs> send it to two life imprisonments terms plus 10 years for his first murder. So sadly, they actually looks like they gave a 10 year for the little girl. Okay. What I think would also have to do with at the time of the murders, the Minimum Sentence Act wasn't in effect. So you cannot, you have to almost punish the person with what were the kinds of sentences back then. Okay. Otherwise, you're retrospective, you're after the fact, punishing someone for something that changed later. Okay. So I think that would probably be the reason. Because nowadays, if you killed a child, you would probably go to life sentence straight out. But nonetheless, without this kind of doggedness, 
these ch- cases could have been charged independently or kind of ind- you know independently of one another, which would have meant that this guy yeah. could be out on the streets again right now. Absolutely. I mean, if he had been convicted back then for the little girl, he would have without a doubt been back on the streets. Yeah. And we know that prison doesn't stop serial murderers. Ultimately, though, the big question mark for me is what happened in that period between 1987 and 2004. That certainly is something which, yeah, in the future, would would be wonderful to go and figure out. Netflix, exactly, um, and he showed no remorse for his actions. Um, he did appeal, um, but was, was rejected. I mean, this case was so solid against him. And, and like we have in South Africa, your sentences run concurrently, meaning they all start at the same time. But again, life sentence. Um, interesting, just normally you, you should only be up for parole hearings after 25 years. He probably falls under the people who, because of certain constitutional judgments, um, I'm trying to think whether he might have benefited or whether after he was convicted only, that he might get a reduced a reduction in, in his length of time. Um yeah, but yes, got a life sentence. So he was locked up for life. Great. And had the detectives and the police involved in this case not been so persistent about linking these different crimes together, maybe he would have been charged for a, you know, one of the crimes alone and maybe he would be out on the streets again. So as comes up in our cut discussions, you know, there are really amazing wonderful things yeah. about our law enforcement um, um yeah. organizations around the country but there are things to be concerned about as well because like we've discussed over over the episodes there has been a brain drain from saps mm. if you like and um so it kind of lessens the likelihood of these kinds of things happening into the future so things we need to be aware of and, 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 and thinking sadly about. if you think about a lot of the cases we've spoken about the investigators are ones of the old guard, guys mm. who'd been cops for like 20, 30 or more years. Yeah. Um, it's not to say we haven't had brilliant successes from sort of newbies, mm. but a lot of these are the old old guys who've been around for, you know, from the days of the murder and robbery units, the serious and violent crime units, etc. Yeah. Just, just one last comment also, though. Actually, if you think about it, he was 16 at the time of his first murder. That, I think, puts him... I'm trying to think whether I've ever had someone younger than him. He's definitely... The youngest, if not the second youngest serial murder, in addition to being the longest serving serial murder. In South so Africa. Tommy Williams, a name that should be on your radar if you're, a, if you're curious about true crime in South Africa, um, a very noteworthy serial killer for those very facts. Potentially one of the youngest serial killers that we've identified in South Africa, so acting from the youngest age and managed to get away with it um, for the for the longest period of time, which speaks, and that ultimately a case that's interesting because it speaks to great police work and unfortunately some of the hurdles that um, we have to we have to deal with when it comes to the justice system in South Africa. Gerard, as always, a very interesting conversation. Like I say with this case, Gerard, the one thing it just kind of cries out for is what happened in those in Mm. in those years between 1987 and 2004 how interesting would it be to try and and fill in that gap and and figure out what tommy williams was doing with his life for that period of time on to other things um as you know my colleague over here my esteemed colleague gerard has written his first book and uh, it is called the profiler diaries from the case files of a police psychologist um it's a going to be an outstanding read no doubt about it you've got to get your hands on a copy if you would like to win a copy right here right now i'm about to tell you how to do that if you'd like to win a copy of jared's first book the profiler diaries from the case files of a police psychologist all we are asking you to do is go to our itunes page choose rating and reviews from the top navigation and leave us a review click the button write a review write your review hit submit and let us know what you think of the show. It's as simple as that. In order for us to, to easily find out who you are writing the review, do leave a handle for us. So, at you. Just leave us a little handle so we know how to track you down. And uh, you could be a winner. Go to our iTunes page. Leave us a review. Tell us what you think of the show. And um, you could be a winner. It's as simple as that. We'll have more episodes of a Profiler coming up in the weeks to come. Brand new episode next week. We've got a cracker for you next week because... We uh, include in next week's episode, it's it's about, a, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but we include in next week's episode excerpts of an interview that Gerard conducted with a killer 
on the day that he was taken into custody in the very room that he committed the murder that he's he's arrested for so we're going to tell you the story of that case and you're going to hear from the killer himself and it's a great listen so uh we'll see you again next week this has been profiler thank you very much for tuning in share 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 the podcast please and um subscribe on youtube if you haven't already done so thank you very much for listening thank you gerard and uh, pleasant dreams to you